thank you to everyone for joining us this afternoon. Here we are today as part of our Talking Business event. The speaker here today needs very little introduction. From musician, to chef, to the entrepreneur behind Reggae Reggae Sauce. Please do put your hands together and welcome Levi Roots. Good thing I had my guitar on Miriam. Thank God for Miriam. Kings of kings and lord of lords. Conquering lion, he rules over all. Kibrela Hamlak, him a Elaya bingi ai Congo shanti. I give thanks and praise every breath I take. Bless me each morning with sunshine I wake. <coughs> Adana Yellowing, El Shaddai Gadama we. Give us sila siya ni gos ni gas. Da 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 Yeah. Whoa. Let's stick Miriam down there to take her a little break. She's my darling, you know, because we talk about inspiration and what makes you, you. How, how did you get from one place to the other? And, and in between that journey, there's quite a few things that, that makes you up into your personality that gets you to venture where you want to go. And there's a few people involved in that, involved in my life and a few things, and I'll start with the things, which is the sayings. Because a mantra, I, I think, for musicians anyway, we have favorite songs, um, we have favorite concerts that we've played at, and for me, being a bit of a chef and musician and everything in one, I, I have a favorite mantra which I've always used to help me along my way. And ever since the day when I found that I wasn't really ready, um, I wasn't really the true Levi Roots that I wanted to be. And it was Shakespeare that changed my life. So I'll share that with you first in the words that helped me to change my life. And, and it's, the, it's the bit in Julius Caesar spoken by Brutus. There is a tide in the affairs of man. Taking up the floods will lead to fortune. Omitted all the days of your lives could be deemed in shallows and in miseries. But on such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. Now, Brutus was saying that to Cassius because the, the Venetian army was about to invade, and Cassius was saying that, let's wait a while until the enemy is weak and all that kind of stuff, and then we attack. But Brutus, being a bit of an entrepreneur, as the name says, you know, someone that goes and gets his stuff, Brutus was saying, Take the current when it serves. Now that's an important one, because for me, I couldn't work that part out when I first read Julius Caesar. I was saying, what does he mean by that? Take the current when it serves, or lose your ventures. Really, he was saying, let's do it now, and then we'll celebrate and drink our cup of tea afterwards. And in some ways, when I ventured in the realms of music and started to not just to sing or to rap or whatever, I wanted to own the music and wanted to be the business part of the music, I really understood what Brutus was saying. Do it now. Take your chance now. But not just any old chance. You've got to be ready. You've got to be the best of you. So not any old you. I know some people are searching and your people are saying, you find you, find find you, but I'm saying find the real you. Because your tide, as Brutus has said, normally comes at the most dangerous parts. Omitted all the days of your lives could be deemed in shallows and miseries. Meaning that if you don't take that chance, 
my chance came with Dragon's Den. Perhaps the most dangerous thing in my life. I mean, as tide goes, it could smash you up against the, the rocks and you never get off your desert island. They're always there, according to Brutus. He's saying that take your current at the most dangerous parts. And I remember when I was doing the sauce with my kids at home and we had decided to take the sauce outside of the local of Brixton and where Caribbean people knew about Caribbean sauces. And we looked at the UK map and we thought, where should we go with it? And my kid would say, Dad, let's go into the Shires. So we would go anywhere that in the, you know, in, in the UK where at the end of it is Shire at the end of it, like North Stafford Shire and places <laughs> like that, where we know no black people don't live in those places. <laughs> we would end up with the sauce and I would be there with the guitar and the kids and, and singing and doing something really different, taking our chances. Because you can't sell ice to the Eskimos. Why sell Caribbean people Caribbean sauce? They already knew that. So we would end up in the Shires. And while we were in the Shires, they were so quiet and there's no dreadlocks Rastaman from Brixton <laughs> that lives locally. And everybody's there having cups of teas and things like that. And I would turn up in the Shires with a bloody guitar <laughs> and a sauce called Reggie Reggie sauce. There's nobody in the bloody Shires could even pronounce reggae at the time. <laughs> now I had written this song on this same guitar. With all the other inspiration in my life, my mom had brought this guitar for me while I was struggling in Brixton. And she spent 500 quid on this same guitar many, many years ago when 500 pounds to her was indeed a lot of money. And I wrote this song because I wanted to be the real me, the best of me when I was selling the sauce. And it went like this. Somebody put some music in the food for me And give me some reggae, reggae sauce Art reggae, reggae sauce it's so nice, I had to name it twice. I call it reggae, reggae sauce. At reggae, reggae sauce. Just like my baby, it is the perfect delight. It's got some peppers and some herbs and spice. So I continued. So nice with your fried chicken, make burgers finger licking, and your barbecue and your drumsticks. Put some reggae reggae sauce on your dish. So nice with fish and chips, and in a vegetarian dish. As a marinade or as a dip, me love you reggae reggae sauce. Nice up your chips, reggae reggae sauce, at reggae reggae sauce. It's so nice, I had to name it twice. I call it reggae, reggae sauce. At reggae, reggae sauce. You can eat it with some crackers. Steam down with two fat snappers. Some oko and some spinners. Swimming in some coconut juice. In Jamaica's national dish. In the ackee and in the saltfish, you can have it with what you wish. In a Chinese, Japanese, everything well crisp. Reggae, reggae sauce, at reggae, reggae sauce. It's so nice, I had to name it twice. I call it reggae, reggae sauce, at reggae, reggae sauce. Yeah. yeah. So you can imagine there in the Shires getting low to that number and singing that song. And when I got eventually to another Shire type places, I was there singing the song with my kids and selling the song. And a lady came over to me and tapped me on the shoulder. She says, Levi, fantastic. We loved you. Know, we loved you, the way you're looking, the, your sauce and your songs and everything like that. Would you like to be on a show called Dragon's Den? <laughs> I'd never seen the show. Never bloody heard of it. I said to her, excuse me lady, there's no way you're gonna get to me to be eating kangaroo testicles. <laughs> I thought it was like a show, like I'm a celebrity to get me out of here. She says, no Levi, it's about business and enterprise and you can come on and sing your song and do your sauce and I'm sure one of the dragons would invest. 
But I'd never seen dragons then, never heard of it. And he was my tide come like what Brutus was saying. The tide in the affairs of man comes to sort of take you from wherever you are to where you want to be. So my tide had come and I was telling the lady to get out of my bloody face. But she gave me a business card and I took her business card. And it was when I got home to my kids and normally we sort of sort out the business cards that we pick up at these type, shire type events. And we saw, well, they saw the BBC card that the lady had given me. And it was my kids that was jumping up and down and saying, Dad, it's Dragon's Den, it's Dragon's Den. And I'm like, what is this Dragon's Den? <laughs> My kids all told me in unison, Dad, whatever you do, don't do dragons then. There's no dreadlocks, Rastaman with no three foot dreadlocks. It's not going to go on BBC and be no dragon slayer. And Dad, for all that, don't go with that bloody song and embarrass us. <laughs> yeah, they thought I was going to embarrass them, you know? But I, I, I wanted to be me. I said to them kids, look, I want to go as me. It's easier to be you. When you pretend it's more difficult, be yourself. I wanted to teach my kids a lesson. I ended up on Dragon's Den because I wanted to teach them. Be yourself. It's easier. I was the dreadlocks raster man from Brixton that I wanted the dragons to invest in me, not the sauce. So you can imagine when I did get up on the show and I sang the song, I didn't know what was happening on Dragon's Den because I never saw the show. I just went with the belief that, you know, I believed in my own self and I thought that I could do it. When I got to that verse, you know, so nice with your fried chicken, make burgers finger licking, I, I took one look up and to, just to see what was happening with the dragons. Because if I knew what the show was about, I would have maybe just gone straight for Peter or for Duncan or for whoever it was. But I didn't know who these guys were at all. So I, I got to that verse and I took a look up just to see what was happening, as you do when you're on stage. And I was used to that. I looked up and at the time it was Richard Farley, short, floppy haired guy that sort of sits on the left hand side. And uh, I took a look up just to see what Richard was doing. And I got to, so when I said, Yo, fried chicken. And I saw Richard doing what I call a little white man's jig. He was doing like a. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that bit? <laughs> He was doing a little tap on his desk that the music had really got to him. It was like, I've never seen anything before. Next to him was no other than Duncan Bannetine. Now, you know, I'm in God, man. Before anything, Duncan says, Levi, I'm sorry, but I'm out. <laughs> so after Duncan said he was out, I relied upon the next dragon next to him. And it, yes, this was Theopathetis. And I thought, I just thought Theopathetes was going to start digging to the numbers now and everything, but he didn't. He said, Levi Roots. What a wonderful name. Is that your real name? I thought, God, I'm going to have to reveal in television that my real name is Keith. <laughs> he didn't invest either. But the guy on the far right, tall, Six foot seven, Peter Jones. Peter Jones saw that it's not going to be about the sauce. He says, Levi, I'm willing to take a punt, a gamble on you. Is it about the sauce or is it about the man? Well, we know that Peter now always invests in the person. He does. Especially if he's a nice, lovely blonde. <laughs> he tells to our Peter. But I was nothing like that. I was the dreadlocks raster man with three foot dreadlocks and a guitar and a sauce called Bloody Reggie Reggie Sauce. But he took the gamble on the man. Two weeks later, we was in his office and your mentor does what he's supposed to do, make a few calls. He rang up Sainsbury's. Chief of Sainsbury's Justin Kings answers the phone. Hello, Peter. While well, I'm in the room with Peter, he says, oh, Peter says, oh, Justin, did you see Dragon's Den? And did you see Levi Roots on there? And they're, they're both talking in this kind of posh type terms that I <laughs> couldn't understand what they were bloody saying. He says, oh, did you see Levi and Dragon's Den the other day and the sauce and all that kind of stuff? And, and Justin King says, yes, we saw it. And I watched it with my son. It was absolutely fantastic. Bring Levi down to see me so we can talk about how Sainsbury's can, you know, help him get his sauce into mainstream. So off we went couple of days after to see Justin in his office. I'd left the kids at home. We were making 65 bottles every time we made a batch. 
which is the size of the Dutch pot that we make it in. Dutch pot, everybody? <laughs> Pass the Dutchie on the left hand side. <laughs> so the kids are at home making the sauce, you know, churning it, doing it. It's so nice. We had to name it twice. We call it reggae, reggae, so 65 bottles. So here I am talking to now to perhaps the most famous man in supermarkets, the second biggest supermarkets in the UK, Sainsbury's, and the chief of, of fucking Sainsbury's is saying to me, Levi, I'm going to make a nice little order. I'm just thinking to myself, please God, don't let him order anything over 65 bottles. <laughs> <laughs> Justin King says, yes, Levi, it's fantastic. I, I saw the sauce and we love it. And it's love, it's Reggie, Reggie sauce and all that kind of stuff. He says, we would like to make a nice little order. Could you please deliver 250,000 bottles of regular? <laughs> I thought, I'm going to have to go home and get the whip out to the kids like and start beating them like. Be careful what you pray for. Be careful. I always wanted that. That's the whole point. I wasn't expecting that. How do you overcome that? I mean, if the, if the chief of Sainsbury says he wants a quarter of a million of your Reggie Reggie sauce, you're not going to tell him to wait until a few months or what have you. You've got to do it now. So my, my most important journey was on the way to Wales in Newport to seek out how we could actually make 250,000 bottles of Reggie Reggie sauce, as it was then, to supply to Sainsbury's. It was about licensing. Now I was expanding the whole Levi Roots brand. We did our first licensing with a company called AB Royal Foods, which is fantastic. But one of the most famous companies and biggest sauce makers within the, within the country. We gave them the Levi Roots brand to do it. Within a few weeks, we did the sauce in record time and we brought it back to St. Bizarre. I said, at this time, I rang Justin King. You know, I said, yes, Mr. King, in my best Jamaican voice. Like, you know, yes, we have the sauce, sir. <laughs> 250,000 bakla reggae, reggae sauce. <laughs> Boom, there it was. Within a few weeks, I had a call from Justin. Levi, your reggae, reggae sauce, which he pronounced rightly this time, is outselling Heinz tomato bloody ketchup. Oh, Ooh, I just thought, are you allowed to do that? <laughs> Are you allowed to be a dreadlocks raster man and selling out the biggest selling sauce in the whole bloody world? Of course you are. Brutus said it. Take the current when it serves or lose your ventures. I had a lot of ventures that I wanted. I did. I dreamt of adventures all my life. I wasn't the best of me when I was dreaming. And I would have been rubbish if I was ready then. I wasn't ready. I was ready by the time Peter had invested. I was ready. That's why I went there in the first place. I, I felt it. But then there's a few things that you needed. And for me, it was back into the beginning of, I suppose you will ask, where is the sauce from? You know, where did I get that? That fantastic idea. I wish I had a bottle now that I could kiss it for you. <laughs> My grandma, her name was Miriam, Jamaica. 60s, the British government had sent a message to people in the Caribbean just during and after the Windrush time. And the letter and the message was to all Caribbean people, come to the UK because there's gold dust on the ground to be picked up. And my family, like many others in the Caribbean, thought that, okay, we'll have some of that. We'll go to the UK and pick up some of that gold dust. And when they got here, they quickly realized that the gold dust was actually dog shit. <laughs> And they had to pick it up. And my parents was good at that because the plan was they had six kids in Jamaica that they wanted to send for one at a time. Because me being the youngest left with the granny, my granny decided to teach me about the things that she knew, which is about this fantastic relish that we had in the family. Now, she never taught my other brother and sister about it for some bloody reason. <sighs> She knew that I needed something special. My, f my first inspirator, it was. The first person that really believed in me, it was her. Everyone else was going to school, I wasn't. Nothing was ever done to the youngest in those days. And you were the last one to be sent for. 
So every year I would see a suitcase would arrive from, from the UK. And them times there was maybe five, six or whatever, but still had lots of sense. I would see a, a suitcase arrive and I would see my granny in tears. And I knew one of us was leaving, coming to the UK. But because we had slept in this one big massive bed, all six of us you know, with granny and everything, for me as a young boy then, and the youngest was, that was always getting shafted out the bloody bed, every time that I saw this bloody suitcase arrive and my granny crying, I was saying, yes! I had a little more room in the bed for me, that's all it was. Until finally, ladies and gentlemen, suitcase arrived, granny is crying, I looked around, I didn't have a brother and sisters to be bloody celebrating for. I knew it was my time. It was my time. But what she had done is prepared me. She prepared me by giving me the one thing that she knew. Well, two actually, because the music was a part of her as well. She was a great singer, my granny, in the Baptist church in, in Jamaica. But it was, it was the teaching of the food that she knew that got me to where I am. Because when I eventually left, when my suitcase arrived and she was in tears, I knew that I wasn't going to see her again. Because I realized that none of my brothers and sisters ever came back. But it was years later when I took her sauce recipe to the carnival, I realized that the inspiration that people brings into your life. Because it was that, the music and the sauce, but particularly the sauce. Because that's when I discovered the market that there's, you've got to spot an opportunity within the market. It's, it's massive to get into that room. And I was so lucky to do that because that is what she gave me. And with that is also the music. And she taught me. Stop your messing around Time is straight and right out Better think of your future Creating problems oh. You know that song? Rudy a message to you, Rudy. A message to you. Stop you boasting around. Time is straight and right out. Better think of your future, creating problems in town. Oh. message to you, Rudy, a message to you, Rudy, yeah! <laughs> so I now, I suppose you will ask, where are we with the brand? Well, I've just opened my first restaurant. Yeah, it's not a restaurant, it's a restaurant, baby. <laughs> And it's absolutely fantastic. And you know, for me, that's one of the most inspiring things that I've done because the sauce was about myself and it was about my granny's history and about the family. But building the restaurant in Stratford has been, you know, one of the most learned things I've learned because I've had to step away from the stuff that I know, you know. And again, that's about entrepreneurship as well, is discovering other things that you know, and it's been brilliant. Restaurant at the moment is giving a real kick up the backside, and I'm learning as I go along that it's one of the most difficult things that I'll ever put my hand to. But I love a challenge. I really do love a challenge, and I think that's what Peter expects of me, is to overcome these challenges, because I think having him there has been perhaps the best tool that I've had since I entered the den and I came out, is having somebody that you can actually rely upon. So if you've tried everything that you've tried, and you've slain your own dragons, but it still doesn't work for you, then write to me and I'll teach you the reggae reggae sauce song. Now I know that will work. Big respect. One love. <laughs>